Chapter 4 of the Buddhist Catechism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Buddhist Catechism by H. S. Alcott. Chapter 4 The Rise and Spread of Buddhism. Question. As regards the number, its followers, how does Buddhism at this date compare with the other chief religions? Answer. The followers of the Buddha Dharma outnumber those of every other religion. Question. What is the estimated number? Answer. About five hundred millions, five thousand lakh, or five hundred kroras. This is five thirteenths, or not quite half, of the estimated population of the globe. Question. Have many great battles been fought and many countries conquered? Has much human blood been spilt to spread the Buddha Dharma? Answer. History does not record one of those cruelties and crimes as having been committed to propagate our religion. So far as we know, it has not caused the spilling of a drop of blood. Question. What, then, is the secret of its wonderful spread? Answer. It can be nothing else than its intrinsic excellence, its self-evident basis of truth, its sublime moral teaching, and its sufficiency for all human needs. Question. How has it been propagated? Answer. The Buddha, during the forty-five years of his life as a teacher, traveled widely in India and preached the Dharma. He sent his wisest and best disciples to do the same throughout India. Question. When did he send for his pioneer missionaries? Answer. On the full moon day of the month Wap, October. Question. What did he tell them? Answer. He called them together and said, Go forth, Bhikkhus. Go and preach the law to the world. Work for the good of others as well as for your own. Bear ye the glad tidings to every man. Let no two of you take the same way. Question. How long before the Christian era did this happen? Answer. About six centuries. Question. What help did kings give? Answer. Besides the lower classes, great kings, rajas, and maharajas were converted and gave their influence to spread the religion. Question. What about pilgrims? Answer. Learned pilgrims came in different centuries to India and carried back with them books and teachings to their native lands. So gradually whole nations forsook their own faiths and became Buddhists. Question. To whom, more than to any other person, is the world indebted for the permanent establishment of Buddha's religion? Answer. To the Emperor Asliyoka, surnamed the Great. Sometimes Piyadasi, sometimes Dharmashoka. He was the son of Bindusara, king of Magaha, arid grandson of Chandragupta, who drove the Greeks out of India. Question. When did he reign? Answer. In the third century B.C., about two centuries after the Buddha's time. Historians disagree as to his exact date, but not very greatly. Question. What made him great? Answer. He was the most powerful monarch in Indian history, as warrior and as statesman, but his noblest characteristics were his love of truth and justice, tolerance of religious differences, equity of government, kindness to the sick, to the poor, and to animals. His name is revered from Siberia to Ceylon. Question. Was he born a Buddhist? Answer. No, he was converted in the tenth year after his anointment as king by Negroda Samanera, an Arhat. Question. What did he do for Buddhism? Answer. He drove out bad bhikkhus, encouraged good ones, built monasteries and dagobas everywhere, established gardens, opened hospitals for men and animals, convened a council at Patna to revise and re-establish the Dharma, promoted female religious education, 
and sent embassies to five Greek kings, his allies, and to all the sovereigns of India to preach the doctrines of the Buddha. It was he who built the monuments at Kapilavastu, Buddha Gaya, Isipatana, and Kusinara, our four chief places of pilgrimage, besides thousands more. Question. What absolute proofs exist as to his noble character? Answer. Within recent years there have been discovered, in all parts of India, fourteen edicts of his, inscribed on living rocks, and eight on pillars erected by his orders. They fully prove him to have been one of the wisest and most high-minded sovereigns who ever lived. Question. What character do these inscriptions give to Buddhism? Answer. They show it to be a religion of noble tolerance, of universal brotherhood, of righteousness and justice. It has no taint of selfishness, sectarianism, or intolerance. They have done more than anything else to win for it the respect in which it is now held by the great pundits of Western countries. Question. What most precious gift did Dharma Shoka make to Buddhism? Answer. He gave his beloved son Mahinda and daughter Sanghamitta to the order and sent them to Ceylon to introduce the religion. Question. Is this fact recorded in the history of Ceylon? Answer. Yes, it is all recorded in the Mahabansa by the keepers of the royal records who were then living and saw the missionaries. Question. Is there some proof of Sanghamitta's mission still visible? Answer, yes. She brought with her to Ceylon a branch of the very Bodhi tree under which the Buddha sat when he became enlightened, and it is still growing. Question, where? Answer, at Anradapura. The history of it has been officially preserved to the present time. Planted in 306 B.C., it is the oldest historical tree in the world. Question, who was the reigning sovereign at that time? Answer. Devanyam Yatisa, his consort, Queen Anula, had invited Sankhamita to come and establish the Bhikkhuni branch of the order. Question. Who came with Sankhamita? Answer. Many other Bhikkhunis. She, in due time, admitted the queen and many of her ladies, together with five hundred virgins, into the order. Question. Can we trace the effects of the foreign work of the Emperor Ashoka's missionaries? Answer. His son and daughter introduced Buddhism into Ceylon. His monks gave it to the whole of northern India, to fourteen Indian nations outside its boundaries, and to five Greek kings, his allies, with whom he made treaties to admit his religious preachers. Question. Can you name them? Answer. Antiochus of Syria, Ptolemy of Egypt, Antigonus of Macedon, Margus of Cyrene, and Alexander of Epirus. Question. Where do we learn this? Answer. From the edicts themselves of Ashoka the Great, inscribed by him on rocks and stone pillars, which are still standing and can be seen by everybody who chooses to visit the places. Question. Through what Western religious brotherhoods did the Buddha Dharma mingle itself with Western thought? Answer. Through the sects of the Therapents of Egypt and the Essenes of Palestine. Question. When were Buddhist books first introduced into China? As early as the 2nd or 3rd century B.C., five of Dharmashoka's monks are said, in the Samanta Pasadika and the Saratha Dipani, to Pali books, to have been sent to the five divisions of China. Question. Whence and when did it reach Korea? Answer. From China in the year A.D. 372. Question. Whence and when did it reach Japan? Answer. From Korea in A.D. 552. Question. Whence and when did it reach Koshin, China, Formosa, Java, Mongolia, Yorkand, Balk, Bakara, Afghanistan, and other Central Asian countries? Answer. Apparently in the 4th and 5th centuries A.D. Question. 
From Ceylon, whither and when did it spread? Answer. To Burma, in A.D. 450, and thence gradually into Arakan, Cambodia, and Pegu. In the 7th century, A.D. 638, it spread to Siam, where it is now, as it has been always since then, the state religion. Question. From Kashmir, where did it spread besides to China? Answer. To Nepal and Tibet. Question. Why is it that Buddhism, which was once the prevailing religion throughout India, is now almost extinct there? Answer. Buddhism was at first pure and noble, the very teaching of the Tathagata. Its Sangha were virtuous and observed the precepts. It won all hearts and spread joy through many nations, as the morning light sends life through the flowers. But after some centuries, bad bhikkhus got ordination, upasampada, the Sangha became rich, lazy, and sensual. The Dharma was corrupted, and the Indian nation abandoned it. Question. Did anything happen about the ninth or 10th century A.D. to hasten its downfall? Answer. Yes. Question. Anything besides the decay of spirituality, the corruption of the Sangha, and the reaction of the populace from a higher ideal of man to unintelligent idolatry? Answer. Yes. It is said that the Mussulmans invaded, overran, and conquered large areas of India, everywhere doing their utmost to stamp out our religion. Question. What cruel acts are they charged with doing? Answer. They burnt, pulled down, or otherwise destroyed our viharas, slaughtered our bhikkhus, and consumed with fire our religious books. Question. Was our literature completely destroyed in India? Answer. No. Many bhikkhus fled across the borders into Tibet and other safe places of refuge, carrying their books with them. Question. Have any traces of these books been recently discovered? Yes. Raj Badur Sarat Chandra Das, C.I.E., a noted Bengali pandit, saw hundreds of them in the Vihara libraries of Tibet, brought copies of some of the most important back with him, and is now employed by the government of India in editing and publishing them. Question. In which country have we reason to believe the sacred books of primitive Buddhism have been best preserved and least corrupted? Answer. Ceylon. The Encyclopedia Britannica says that in this island Buddhism has, for specified reasons, retained almost its pristine purity to modern times. Question. Has any revision of the text of the Pitakas been made in modern times? Answer. Yes. A careful revision of the Vinaya Pitaka was made in Ceylon in the year A.D. 1875 by a convention of the most learned bhikkhus under the presidency of H. Sumangala Pradhana Thavira. Question. Has there been any friendly intercourse in the interest of Buddhism between the peoples of the southern and those of the northern Buddhist countries? Answer. In the year A.D. 1891, a successful attempt was made to get the Pradhana Nayakas of the two great divisions to agree to accept fourteen propositions as embodying fundamental Buddhistic beliefs, recognized and taught by both divisions. These propositions, drafted by Colonel Alcott, were carefully translated into Burmese, Sinhalese, and Japanese, discussed one by one, unanimously adopted, and signed by the chief monks, and published in January 1892. Question. With what good result? Answer. As the result of the good understanding now existing, a number of Japanese bhikkhus and samaneras have been sent to Ceylon and India to study Pali and Sanskrit. Question. Are there signs that the Buddha Dharma is growing in favor in non-Buddhistic countries? Answer. There are. Translations of our more valuable books are appearing. Many articles in reviews, magazines, and newspapers are being published and excellent original treatises by distinguished writers are coming from the press. Moreover, Buddhist and non-Buddhist lecturers are publicly discoursing on Buddhism to large audiences in Western countries. 
The Shinshu sect of the Japanese Buddhists have actually opened missions at Honolulu, San Francisco, Sacramento, and other American places. Question. What two leading ideas of ours are chiefly taking hold upon the Western mind? Answer. Those of karma and reincarnation. The rapidity of their acceptance is very surprising. Question. What is believed to be the explanation of this? Answer. Their appeals to the natural instinct of justice and their evident reasonableness. End of chapter 4. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah.